God be praised. Welcome. Good to have you all with us, with us visitors, members. Um, you can follow along on Version, which is a free app, uh, Google Play or the App Store, and look under Live Events, Preston Crest, outline there, or the bulletin you got, hopefully when you came in this morning, uh, has a sermon outline as well. We are so glad that you're with us. As John Scott said, if you're a first-timer, we've got a gift for you back at the Welcome Center, so make sure to get that. I don't know if you guys heard about the guy that uh, moved back to the U.S. from Germany and uh, deleted all of the German contacts on his phone, thus making his phone Hans-free. Hmm? Like that? Hans-free? Or this one actually has to do with the sermon this morning. Uh, you know, as far as the feeding of the 5,000, five loaves and uh, two fishes feeding a multitude of people, Christians call that a miracle. The Spanish call that tapas. Tapas. Did I say that right? Okay, good. Tapas. At first service, he said I didn't say that quite right. So ta- I like tapas. Tapas are good, but it takes about $130 to for me to eat at a tapas restaurant. Um, so we've been in a journey, if you're new here, a six-week journey so far through the gospel of Mark, and we're calling it the Son of God because first verse in the entire gospel announces that he is that. Um, and he is showing that in many ways we are watching. Uh, it's incredible, really. The lame are walking, <laughs> the blind see, uh, the sick are healed, the demon-possessed are given their lives back, storms are being calmed. Uh, Wherever Jesus goes, uh, things change. Amazing things happen, and we've watched that happen. Now, very early on in the gospel, until this point in the background, you also have uh, an intensive training course, I guess you could call it, this discipleship course, this spiritual formation work with Jesus and these 12 men, a ragtag group of fishermen and tax collectors, all sorts of people. They are in this uh, spiritual formation program of Jesus And they are being taught a lot of things. They are seeing a lot of things and experiencing a lot of things. Uh, But it's all about helping them to become like their master, like their rabbi, like Jesus. And that's really uh, the goal of discipleship even to this day is to help us become more and more like Jesus. When we accept the gift of salvation, we receive that for ourselves. We are also accepting this gift of a calling to be part of his work on earth and to become more like him. Now, in this Jesus spiritual formation program, it's not just about Bible study and reading and prayer. It's just as much about uh, an active lifestyle of serving and, and of sharing the gospel with other people. So we see all of that as he trains these disciples. And keeping that in mind, we're going to get into our text this morning from the Gospel of Mark about this miracle of feeding multitudes of people with basically a snack. So here we go, starting in verse 30. Uh, And as we catch up with them, and and we get into the text, the apostles, as part of this spiritual formation ministry, have been sent out on some short-term mission projects, all right? Two by two, they have gone to different villages, they have preached, and that preaching has been accompanied with amazing signs and wonders as they've had the authority given by Jesus to cast out demons and to heal sicknesses. And now they're coming back to report to Jesus. Verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone, or so they thought. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them, Jesus, so they're landing, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, it's already, uh, this is a remote place 
and it's already getting late, send the crowds away so that they can go to the nearby towns and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what, they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all of these people. How much bread do you have? He asked. Go and find out. They came back and reported. I doubt if it took a lot of time to come up with this count, right? <laughs> we have five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. And they ate as much as they wanted. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed from those loaves. <laughs> what a story. And as it opens, the disciples, they're back from their short-term mission project. Some of you guys, actually a lot of us, 120 people just got back um, a little over a week ago from short-term mission projects to Guatemala and Honduras and New Mexico. And I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that when you got back, you were kind of tired, kind of exhausted like these disciples were, kind of wanting a little quiet maybe, kind of wanting to be alone. And they were too. And Jesus recognized that and was going to take them off to this remote place. And that sounded really good. To these exhausted apostles but you notice what happened they had this little vacation plan to get away chose a remote place got on the boat headed that direction but according to mark people from many towns saw them get on the boat and kind of see that trajectory and so kind of jogging along on the beach ahead of them got there before Jesus and the apostles and mark says in verse 33 there people from many towns ran along the shore and got there ahead of them. Vacation interrupted, right? Peace and quiet just vanishes. Now, before I go on, let me just acknowledge something, and I think this is very easy to skip over, but I think for a lot of this, uh, us, this might be kind of important. Certainly not the big deal here, but something worth recognizing. It's just that Jesus knows that we need rest. I mean, he, he saw his guys, and he's like, yeah, you look like you need some time away. I mean, he recognizes that, that that's a good thing that we need from time to time. In this case, though, they land, there are all these crowds, and Jesus does Jesus things. He feels compassion for these multitudes of people, and so he begins to teach them, begins to instruct them. The day wears on, the hour grows late, and they are, remember, in a remote place. This was supposed to be this getaway to this remote place. There aren't, uh, you know, like chilies or Chick-fil-A's around there or anything. It's remote, so... People are getting hungry. They need to go eat. They need to go find places to sleep. And, and now, I want to work through the rest of the story using a study guide this morning. That's it. We're going to really work on this. You're going to need that bulletin or, or you version this morning. We're going to work from that to really unpack what it looks like to move from doing life in the natural, which is what we naturally do, to move over and join Jesus in, let's call it the realm of the supernatural, right? And before we get into unpacking that, here's the big idea. Spoiler alert, this is what it's all about. This is on your outline as well. Jesus, what he's doing, he invites us to take what we have. It may be a lot, it may be a little. He's inviting us to take what we have, to go into the world, and to make a difference for the people that we come into contact with. And if we will do that with him, amazing things are going to happen, all right? In that move to join Jesus in his ministry, I have to move from the natural to the supernatural and get beyond my limited sight and my selfishness and my shallowness and join him and walk by faith. So again, we've got these disciple, 
disciples who are exhausted. They're with Jesus. These crowds are hungry. They've been on these mission projects. They haven't even had time to feed themselves. But Jesus sees beyond all of this. And I want to start on the outline this morning with us represented by the disciples. And it's just this simple idea. Really, this is a self-affirming truth. Nothing exciting about this statement. But that first thing there on the left-hand column is, I see what I see. And you're like, well, of course I see what I see. And I tend to see what interests me, what I value, what I think is important. I tend not to see other things. I tend to sometimes not see people. I can even kind of ignore people because of my carnal, because of my um, natural vision. But Jesus knew how special people were. He knew they were made by God. He knew they were valued by God. He knew that they were image bearers of God. I love what C.S. Lewis says in his book, The Weight of Glory. He says, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. When Jesus saw people, he saw souls. When Jesus saw people, he saw people who he would die for because the Father loves them so much. When the apostles saw people, they saw an interruption in their vacation. When the apostles saw their hunger, they saw a problem that needed to be fixed. On the other side of the ledger, Jesus saw people. He saw women, men, children who his father cares for. He, he saw people with souls, people made in the image of God. And when I do life with Jesus supernatural, I begin to see what he sees. And the text says he saw them. He saw these crowds. He sees you, by the way. He does not ignore you. He sees you. He sees whether you're doing well or whether you're not doing well. He sees your pain. Miraculous ministry, though, miraculous ministry is blocked when I don't allow myself to see the people that Jesus sees all around me. Vision precedes provision. God wants to take care of people. God wants to provide for them, but I've got to be able to see them so that God can use me as his channel of blessing. Vision precedes provision. I also, on the other side, I feel what I feel, okay? I feel what I feel. The problem is, please don't amen this, my heart is not nearly as big as Jesus' heart, okay? I've got this tiny Grinch-sized heart compared to Jesus. And what happens when I try to do life on my own, when I'm living in the natural, my motions follow my emotions, my actions follow my feelings, and my feelings are so weak for people. My compassion is so shallow and weak. And in this story, as part of Jesus' spiritual intensive training program, he's teaching us that we need to begin to feel what he feels. And so, as a disciple, that's the goal. I begin to feel what he feels. And Mark tells us in verse 34, he felt compassion. And in the Greek, that means to be moved in your guts. I mean, just to be moved with the situation as another, of another person. It, it, they're sheep without a shepherd. They're hurting. And as a church family at Preston Crest, we're guided by two big vision statements. If you've been here anytime, you know what these are. It's passion for God and, yes, compassion for people. Passion for God and compassion. And we want to be hungry for these. We want more. I want more passion for God. I want more compassion for people. That's what we want as a church. That's our prayer as a church. Now, in Mark's account, moving on, we see the apostles kind of confused by Jesus. By the way, 
if Jesus is Lord and if Jesus is beyond us, we need to be willing to give him the right to confuse us sometimes. Does that make sense? We need, we need to be willing for Jesus to say some perplexing things, some things that are kind of beyond our understanding, to stretch us a little bit. Well, they were confused here because Jesus goes to them and he says, they look hungry, why don't you feed them? And they're like, what, what are we going to feed them with? Jesus says, well, tell me what you've got. Well, we've done a count. We've got two fish. We've got five loaves of bread. And that might be enough, maybe, to feed Peter and James. Maybe they could stretch it and have a light supper with Peter, James, and John. Certainly wouldn't have fed the 12. And they've got 5,000 men and their families. Thousands of people. It's the AAC here. You know, thousands of people. And naturally... Naturally, the disciples reason there is nothing they can do about the empty stomachs of all of these people. Here's the thing. I don't act. This is on the outline. I don't act because I'm aware of what I don't have. They're aware we don't have enough. They're aware of their scarcity. They're aware that the supply of their resources is terribly limited. And when it comes to the huge needs around us in our mission field of Dallas, Texas, we tend to be aware of how little we have or how little money we have or how little time we have to spare or how few talents or abilities we have. At least, hey, compared to these other people, they've got a lot more uh, training and talent than, than, than I've got or whatever. People are so keenly aware often of their limits of what they don't have. And even if they see, I see that person. And even if they have compassion, I know that person has needs. They don't act. Because they're only aware of what they don't have, of their inability to, 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 to meet those needs. That's very natural. By the way, there is humor in this story. The punchline of the joke is when Jesus says, How much food do you have? Now, why is that a punchline to the joke? Because he's the one in Mark chapter 6, verse 8, when they went on their short-term mission projects, he's the one who told them verbatim, don't take any food with you. <laughs> That's a joke. You told me not to take any food. Now you're asking us to do an inventory of how much food we have to feed these thousands of people? Good one, Jesus. Now the supernatural, here we go. I act knowing that Jesus is not interested in what I don't have. All he asks is what I have. Verse 38, how much bread do you have? He doesn't need for you to lecture him on how little you have. He's saying, will you give me what you do have? Will you let me work with that? And our tendency is to think of what we don't have. Jesus is not interested in that at all. He's not asking you if you've got a parking lot full of semi-trailer trucks packed with foodstuffs to feed these masses of hungry people. He's not asking you if you have 45 hours of free time a week to give to ministry. He's not asking you if you've got a Ph.D. in counseling so you can do intensive therapy with somebody who's got all sorts of junk going on in their lives. He's not asking you that. He's asking you, you got a couple hours to make a visit to somebody in the hospital? You got 15 minutes to call someone who you know is lonely? Just ask them how they're doing? Or someone who's lost a spouse or a family member? Just say, how are you doing? He's asking you that. What do you have? Do you have ears? Can you sit down and listen to somebody unburdened? You got arms to give somebody a hug? Hands to serve? A couple of weeks ago, I get home. Ooh, the house smells good. Isla's fixing something yummy. It smells very bacony, by the way. Turns out it's quiche. And there was other good stuff in the quiche, but I'm just locked in on the bacon, and it was in there. So. so we ate quiche. 
And then she said, you know, I actually made another quiche. She said these, these guys, uh, two or three single guys, moved in a couple doors down in a town home a couple doors down. I hadn't met them, never seen them. She said, why don't you take this quiche down there and see if they want it? So, yeah, go down there, knock on the door. Hey, I'm Gordon. You want some quiche? <laughs> They're single guys, so yes, yes, we do. He's not asking you for what you don't have. He's asking you for what you have. Got an extra quiche? <laughs> Got a few bucks? Got a little time? Don't worry about whether what you, th you think you have little or much. Will you offer Jesus what you do have to serve in his mission? Naturally, the disciples, though, um, they're thinking, but <laughs> two fish, five loaves, they're thinking, this is on your outline as well. They're thinking, I can't imagine what difference this would make. I mean, this isn't a drop in the bucket, even, compared to the needs of these thousands of people. Five loaves and two fish, not going to make a difference. But Jesus, this is the faith part of this. Jesus wants us to step out and join him in this amazing ministry that his spirit is a part of, that his spirit inhabits. And this is the thing. I do what I can. That's all I can do. I do what I can, and I leave the results up to him. Amen? I leave the results up to him. The results are pretty stunning here. The results are that 5,000 men and their families were fed from that lunch. I mean, that snack. And then how the story ends. I don't know if you notice this, but Jesus blesses those five loaves, those two fishes. They begin to serve all of that. They start distributing. And there is not only enough that everybody's like stuffed. Everybody's like, wow, I'm full. But there are how many basketfuls left over? Twelve. How many apostles are there in the story? Twelve. You think that's accidental? That each one of these apostles, at the end of the story, thinking Jesus was crazy, we're going to feed people with this snack, each one of those apostles is left at the end holding a bucket full of leftovers. And I love it. Jesus is teaching them something. And he's showing them something. But first, the other side of that, we tend to think, what I have just isn't enough to make a difference. Now for the lesson. Here's what he's teaching them. Jesus wants me to see that when I bring what I have to the table, then he will bring what he has to the table. Jesus took, verse 41, the five loaves, two fish, looked to heaven, and he blessed it. He brought, what he, had, he brought his blessing into this. God has always, always, always preferred to work with ordinary people just like you and me. People with limited resources, people who are busy, people who don't have tons of spare time, regular folks. Now, did Jesus really need them to give him those five loaves and two fish in order to feed the multitudes? No! Of course he didn't need that. He could have prayed, bam, piles of food appear, and people just go at the buffet, right? He could have done it that way. Or he could have skipped the whole food thing altogether. They're hungry, boom, prayer. Supernaturally filled everybody's stomachs. They're all, hey, I thought I was hungry, but now I feel great. He did not need their five measly loaves of bread and two fish. He could have bypassed the whole thing. But God wanted them to understand and believe. When I bring what I have, he brings what he has. He wants this partnership. The kingdom of God is like this bring your kid to work day. God's inviting us to join him in this kingdom project. We bring what we have, he brings what we show up, he shows up. And it's amazing the miraculous resources that are unleashed when that happens. Look. At Preston Crest, we're a believing church. We believe that we, when we pray, God hears our prayers. God listens to our prayers. God answers our prayers. We do life together as a community of faith. And we know that when we do that, we experience the power of God unleashed among us and His presence experienced among us. We know that. So 
Let's finish out with a prayer and let's call out to him because this story is all about him, isn't it? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are yours. You bought us with a price. You saved us from sin and shame. You made us your own. And you've invited us to join you in your work, in your kingdom work, right here, right now. We are part of your people. We are part of your global movement to share the gospel by the way we live, by the way we share and serve, by the way we tell the gospel story of your life and death and resurrection. And you've placed us, God. You've placed us in Dallas, Texas. You've given us this incredible mission field. We're excited by this trust that you have in putting us right here in this strategic place, and we're humbled by that as well. Give us eyes to see. Give us eyes to see. May we see people, Lord, the way you see people. Whether it's a clerk at a grocery store or a neighbor across the street, just give us your eyes and give us your big heart. Help us to share your compassion for people. And Lord, we believe in your love and we believe in your power. May we offer what we have, whatever it is, small or much, may we offer what we have to help the needs that we see instead of being paralyzed by natural and carnal thinking that focuses on what we don't have. May your spirit work in us and with us so that we release to you, Lord, our time and our money, our ears to listen, our arms to hold, our hands to serve. This week, July 23rd through July the 30th, this week, I pray very specifically, God, that you will help us to see someone each day that we can serve in a small way or maybe in a larger way. And I pray specifically that it will be someone that we would not normally see, but someone who your spirit will open our eyes to see. And Lord, our end of the deal is this. Show us that person. Show us those people. And we pledge to bring what we have to the table so that you will bring what you have to the table. In your grace and love, we live and serve, and in your name we pray. Amen. You might be ready this morning to cross that line of faith to give your life to Christ. Daisy did that at first service this morning. It was a pleasure to witness her baptism. Um, Maybe you have a prayer need. You can come and pray with me or one of our shepherds or just get together with one of these believers that's around you and pray, huddle up and pray about what that is that's going on in your heart. But the same God that worked miracles, that saw, that had compassion in the New Testament, He is alive. He is here today. Let's respond to Him as we stand together and worship.